Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of State of the Hack. If you missed the first episode, it's been recorded and published, uh, hosted by Austin Baker and Doug Beanstalk. Title is Keg Tapping Out, Don't Be a One Trick Bot Pony. I uh, highly recommend you check it out if you haven't already. Uh, I'm Evan Pena, a host for this show, along with Julian. Hi, guys. Julian Pelleggi here, also a host of this show, um, Incident Response Manager based in Canada. As you guys can see by my Canadian flags over here, so you'll never forget. I'm uh, Brett Hawkins. I'm a uh, senior uh, red team consultant here at Mandiant. I've um, been here for about a couple years focusing on uh, red team assessments and penetration testing. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Olivo, and I'm a consulting intern. I've been a consulting intern for around six or seven months now. Been great. Uh, I love offensive security, so I spend a good amount of my time doing hack the box research or just staying up to date with the latest tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures. Uh, and during my free time, I like to play the piano. I love playing soccer and hanging out with my dog, Mr. Chow. So, uh, Andrew, you say you've been an intern for like six months now. And normally our internships go just during the summertime. We have summer internship programs for every region of the Americas. And uh, for Andrew, he was in the central region uh, intern and worked with the central region team. In this case, due to COVID, it was a remote internship, which is the first time we ever did a remote internship. Uh, and even when it was remote, I think Andrew got to do some really cool work, which we're going to talk about today. And so, Andrew, first off, congratulations on your extension of your internship program throughout the fall semester. That's awesome that we Thank got you guys. <laughs> a little bit longer. Super cool. Uh, so why don't you give us a little bit of a background on, uh, you know, what you were doing during your internship here and, and some of the work that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, for sure. So my experience as an intern has been absolutely amazing. Uh, I got to work in some very complex, challenging and exciting projects such as red teams, internal penetration tests, social engineering assessment, web application assessments, and sometimes even some unique projects that we don't usually come across. And I got to work on these projects with very smart and very talented people like Brett, who I can't get tired of seeing get domain admin. <laughs> and uh, this is a team that not only helps you grow technically at a very, very fast rate, but also helps you grow as a person as, and as a team player. And as a consulting intern, I had the chance to do some research and build internal tools for the red team practice. So over the summer, I got to build, uh, I, I built an office document payload generator, which would automatically uh, build malicious office documents that you could customize and it does it within seconds. And part of what this tool has is an evasion technique called BBA purging, which is the topic that we'll be discussing more today. Yeah, those maldocs, that seems to be an initial vector that we commonly see, uh, you know, obviously in phishing campaigns, right? So like normally as a red teamer, you know, uh, I see a lot of HGA files, click one scripts, and, and also malicious macros or maldocs that are sent. And in my opinion, I feel like uh, one of those situations that is like it's difficult to come up with new initial vector payloads when it comes to payload execution. When it comes to like filling out forms like, you know, a spoofed, you know, web login form or whatever, like that's a little bit easier. Uh, because it's controlled on our site versus on the host itself, which gives room for detection and, and even response, right? So whenever you were coming up with this payload or this this sort of method to weaponizing malicious documents, you know, what's what did you find that kind of like inspired that problem? Or, you know, so you found a problem that you wanted to identify a solution for and and uh, whenever you're, you know, coming up with this this research or looking into the research. So yeah, during my first week at Mandiant, I was obsessed at looking at all the different tools that we had and all the different techniques that we use for our red teams. And one of them was the way we use our malicious documents. So uh, the process of building these office documents can take a while and it's you, easy to make mistakes along the way. And given how, how that we're, there's always, our projects aren't very long and that we were, were working very hard and very fast. We, I, I thought that it would be a, that what we're missing is a payload generator for office documents that would allow us to quickly build these documents 
so then we can uh, move forward quicker for these engagements, so, uh, this, these red team engagements. So the document, uh, the office document payload generator that I built uh, includes some internal techniques that we use, but it also includes sandbox evasions. Uh, it also includes, like I said, BBA purging and a few other techniques. And yeah. for folks who uh, maybe aren't as familiar with this, just to give you guys a little context, the, the office document form of, of kind of initial compromise is still probably the most common way attackers and I guess you guys can tell me about red teamers uh, would be able to penetrate an environment, right? So when you're thinking about this, this is definitely uh, something that most organizations are going to face, right? You're, you're probably receiving malicious documents constantly all day. And that's why um, this is this is a very topical piece of information for, for orgs who are watching this, right? Like this is something absolutely you'll have to deal with. And, uh, and the techniques that Andrew is going to talk about. Yeah, and we've seen great success with malicious office documents, even in 2020. Uh, so it's, that, although it's a thing, it's an old technique and an old method for initial access, it's still being used and it's still successful. Yeah, from a, from a red team perspective, really, you know, when it comes to initial access payloads, there's usually a, a couple of things to take into account. Uh, one is obviously from an evasion standpoint, something that you can evade, right? Host-based security controls. But the other thing is the user. So you want something that the user is going to interact with, that they're comfortable with, and they're used to interacting with. And Office Documents, you know, business users, they interact with Office Documents every day. So it's not kind of a, it's not a foreign type of thing to interact with an Office Document. So the other kind of enticing thing from a red team perspective, and also from a threat actor, is that, you know, it's something that the users are comfortable with. You know, they, they use macros right in their day-to-day -day life. So um, have, having that comfort with the user also helps uh, in terms of success. Yeah, no, these are all really, really good points. And Julian, you made a really good point on, you know, malicious documents are still very much used today in, in some of the best, you know, phishing campaigns and initial vectors. And I think what people think need to understand is you have a malicious document that comes in and that document is weaponized with a macro. And so at the end of the day, a, a macro can be doing a lot of different things on the back end. It could just be dropping a file to disk and using CMD to execute it. There's a lot of detections around that. It might have a shell code runner using some sort of like BDA to .NET, J, you know, scripting language in there. It could be a lot of different things. And I think what's interesting about today's topic is that this is just a new method of weaponizing malicious documents that is getting around detections today. So while it may be an old technique, that you know there's maldocs in malicious macro enabled documents that's just one small component of the larger picture right of how is weaponized and that's where andrew's research comes into play here so andrew if you want to kind of get into a little bit more of the in-depth background of what vba purging is and how it's working and a little bit about how it's getting around modern day detection i think that'd be a good uh, good background yeah for sure so BBA purging is a modern evasion technique for malicious office documents that has been slowly grown in popularity. And basically how VBA purging works is it removes suspicious strings found in the performance cache, performance cache of a module stream. And by doing so, it can evade uh, static analysis detection for Yara rules and security products. Now to get more in depth, uh, I feel it's important to give a little background as to how VBA code is stored and interpreted by Office documents. So an Office doc, when an Office document contains VBA code, it is, uh, the VBA code is stored in what we call a module stream. And this module stream is split into two sections. There is the performance cache and the compressed source code. These two sections are separated by a module offset. The performance cache is compiled VBA code that was compiled by the VBA engine when you save a document. And this section is used for performance reasons. So when macros is enabled, it'll run quicker. The compressed source code is VBA source code compressed using one of Microsoft's proprietary compression algorithms. Um, so yeah, so when you send a document, to some, uh, an office document that contains VBA code to someone, the receiving end will, will access the performance cache only if their office version is the same version that was used to compile the VBA uh, the VBA code. So if it's not the same version, the compressed source, the compressed source code is decompressed, compiled and run instead. So that is how a module stream is stored and interpreted. VBA purging takes advantage of how this modules, how these module streams are interpreted 
by completely removing the performance cache, changing the module offset to zero, and leaving the compressed source code intact. And this does two things. One, it removes valuable strings or suspicious strings found in the performance cache that Yara rules and modern security products depend on for detection. And two, it forces the Office applications to decompress the compressed source code, compile it, and then run it. That is really, really interesting, Andrew. So uh, a, a few questions for you. First off, did you learn that in school? Is that like what's your, what's your what the, is that the curriculum part of, of what you're learning in school? And, and I would. <laughs> like compared to what you're learning during your internship, like how did you get to this level, right, at, during the internship program? Or So while building my office document payload generator for the red team practice, I I read this article by Didier Stevens where he explained what VBA purging is and how it's being used by threat actors and that there's this .NET library called EP plus that will accidentally or um, one of its side effects is that it VBA purges the Excel documents that it creates. And I was using that .NET library for the office document payload generator. So while reading that, I found out that, oh, Okay, so I accidentally added a, an evasion technique to the off, to the Excel documents that we were creating. So, but we there was this .NET library on, EP Plus only generates Excel documents. So we I didn't have a tool to VBA purge Word documents or other type of Office documents, and that is where I decided to uh, build. Uh, a separate tool specifically to VBA purge different types of office documents. I got to say, uh, that seems pretty, um, pretty advanced, you know, for, for the kind of things that an intern would normally be dealing with. If you were to maybe compare with, uh, other folks, other students that, you know, how do you think that, uh, what you've been working on compares to what, what some of the other folks, you know, have, have been working on? Um, it, internally at Mandian or just around the just in general. Yeah. yeah just in general. Know. So, uh, so I was talking to some students uh, at George Mason and also some colleagues of mine who had internships in different areas, and some of them weren't very, too happy or they weren't challenged enough with the projects they were given. And, but at Mandiant, you're literally put into the front lines of these projects. They throw you into the front lines, so you're kind of forced and challenged to learn uh, and, stay, and stay on your toes and learn and stay like what's going on and actually apply your um, your skills while doing these assessments. And at least for the research side, uh, I think one thing at Mandian that we that we appreciate or something that Mandian loves is, is research. So uh, I was talking to Evan over the summer about uh, about my project and about BBA purging. And he brought up that at Mandiant, we have different teams. So we have the blue team, right? We have the threat intel team, we have the red team. And having that capability of interacting with each other really helps all aspects uh, at Mandiant. So uh, that's, from, from my experience, the, this internship is, has been amazing and I can't think of a better place. Yeah, no, I mean, we're you obviously came out with some really cool stuff here and you got some really good experience that you're, you know, you don't get to learn during school, right? I mean, these are frontline experience. You get to see what we're actually doing. You shadowed some awesome engagements, identified a problem, and then came up with a solution that's impacting now the global red team, right? Like we get to use your tools on, you know, a lot of like all our engagements globally. I mean, that's a really big impact, really cool opportunity for, for an intern. And here you are on State of the Hack. So <laughs> congratulations on that. That's true. Yeah, and hopefully soon a, a blog post will be coming out along with a tool for BBA purging. Which is another really cool opportunity. I think you're actually the first intern at Mandian to ever release a blog post. So congratulations on that as well. <laughs> It's an honor. Uh, Thanks. So, uh, just real quick, we, oh, speaking of blog posts, recently, uh, this year actually, we released a blog post on VBA stomping. Uh, VBA stomping, it's a technique we've seen attackers use to, to do some, something similar, you know, m m uh, weaponizing malicious documents so that they can get you know, a foothold on the network and uh, evade detection. There's becoming a lot more detections around VBA stomping, but you want to compare the difference and explain, you know, what VBA stomping is versus VBA purging? Yeah, yeah, I, I can kind of talk to that a little bit. Um, so VBA stomping came out 
I mean, a few years ago, I think there was a DerbyCon talk on it. And with with BBA stomping, Andrew kind of talked about the different module streams, right? There's the performance cache and then there's compressed source code. So with BBA stomping, um, basically it's it just has that performance cache, right? It doesn't have the, the compressed source code. So, you know, reverse of that is VBA purging where it just has the compressed source code and not the performance cache. So really in terms of differences, that's like the key difference between that VBA stomping technique and VBA purging. Uh, the down, the, the downside to the VBA stomping technique. So as Andrew mentioned, uh, you know, with performance cache, it's kind of has to be compiled for a particular office version, right? So you would kind of need to know that ahead of time before you would send, you know, that office document to, you know, to your target, right? So really with a VBA purging, it's a lot better because there's not that reliance on a specific office version because it's going to be compiled on the target workstation. And um, so both of those methods, Brett, purging and stomping, would you consider those evasions for, for static analysis essentially? Yeah, I think uh, signature based type of detections. Yeah. So basically getting rid of specific signatures that, you know, yeah, static analysis tools would, would try to identify. Nice. Yeah. So, um, and, and Andrew, quick question for you in weaponizing your malicious documents. I mentioned earlier that there's different ways of weaponizing a document, like again, downloading a file, for example, saving something to disk using CMD to execute. It's kind of like a, an old method of, weaponizing a malicious document. Shellcode injection seems to be one of the more modern ways of doing it with a lot of different ways. Like I mentioned .NET, using the .NET library, .NET to JScripts, we see a lot as well on HTA files. Uh, what's what's kind of your method right now for weaponizing malicious documents using VBA purging? Is it shellcode injection or shows it differ than uh, any other shellcode show code runner, for example? So how, so when you run a, when you execute your shellcode or your payload in a malicious office document, there's different ways, right? So there's using the uh, when you can create an object and use shell, so but that will create a child process for CMD. But there, like you said, there's more modern ways like importing uh, libraries from like DLLs or importing Windows APIs to uh, inject itself into the word process itself. Another execution method is WMI, which is also grown in popularity. But when you run these execution techniques, you need to specify it in the code. So if you want to use uh, like WMI, you will literally have the word WMI in the code. And one thing that BBA purging does, though, is it removes these suspicion, suspicious strings or suspicious functions used for execution. And it, it, it adds a, an extra layer of evasion to, to those office documents. Very cool. And, and, and in terms of like the results of VBA purging, you know, normally what sort of results do you get after, after during this? Oh, that's a good question. So when doing my research and doing some testing, I was using uh, a macro payload from a unicorn, which is a public, uh, tool made by TrustedSec. And I use that to compare the results of it uh, in VirusTotal, like just a regular um, macro payload generated with Unicorn in a, doc in a Word document, upload to VirusTotal. You should expect to get around 30 to 36 detections, right? But when you VBA purge that document, that document went down to 12 detections. And that is a payload that has been pretty well signatured and it's it, it, it's fairly old it, it's not very very new but it's uh it's definitely well known and signatured but the fact that you can bring the detection rate down by s between 60 to 67 percent sometimes even 100 percent is pretty significant and this is uh, i think it's important to build awareness about this technique that, that speaks to um also the effectiveness of your traditional antivirus right those signature based Static analysis type platforms. Uh, this is a great example of how they, they can be easily evaded or bypassed or the effectiveness can be reduced, um, which goes into a whole other topic on EDR, but let's talk about that another time. Yeah, yeah. No, but um, it, it is true that there are still a good number of modern security products that still depend on static analysis or use YAR rules or look that look for specific strings or sequence of hex bytes that for detection, it's not the best way to detect 
malware or malicious office documents, uh, it should still be used, but it should not be something to rely on. So, you know, uh, Brett, given that, you know, Andrew's, you know, come up with a new, another, yet another method, right, of, of weaponizing, you know, malicious documents to be used for phishing payloads. I think we need to step back a little bit and talk about like a lot of these phishing campaigns that we're seeing today. So it's one thing to weaponize a malicious document, but if you have an email that says, hey, this is a document where you open it, hopefully you don't get a very good success rate of people clicking it. So in your experience as a, as a very senior red teamer here at Mandiant, what are some of the most common phishing campaigns that you'll use uh, so that people kind of know like what, what's being seen out there and what are commonly lures, if you will, to, to lure people into clicking on or opening these documents and enabling macros? Sure, yeah. So from an office document standpoint, uh, so let's talk about emails, right? So some pretexts that we like using are some sort of type of document sharing. You you have a document waiting for you, whether it's like, uh, you know, you know, a new payroll schedule or, you know, um, some type of like employee guidelines, right? So that's type of the type of pretext we usually would use with the documents. Hey, you have a document waiting for you, you know, you know, you need to log in and, and access it. Um, same thing with phone-based social engineering. So we also do phone-based social engineering um, and a similar type of pretext. We'll usually kind of use, hey, you know, we need, to, need you to open this document type of thing. Uh, another thing uh, that we use these office documents for um, is we'll actually, um, you know, submit kind of resumes, um, kind of like applying for like jobs uh, at companies. And we actually submit these office documents to their job portals as well. So uh, there's, there's kind of three different aspects that we use office documents. And like I said, it's, it's, uh, we have a pretty, pretty decent success rate with, with office documents still. I think, yeah. uh, oh, go okay. ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, one of my, you mentioned payroll, right? Like everyone's interested in what everyone makes. And I've done a few of these where I send a payroll, you know, Excel spreadsheet and it's macro enabled. So when you see, you can do open source intelligence to get, get employee names and email addresses and other information. So you can craft a very targeted, you know, Excel spreadsheet that includes employee names that people would actually recognize. And then you have different columns, right? That say like, you know, bonus or, uh, you know, I don't know, like salary, obviously base salary, stocks, whatever the case may be for that organization. And then the fields won't be empty. And it'll have like a disclaimer that says you must enable macros to populate the fields. And then there's code that actually will populate those fields so it looks legitimate. And then on the back end, there's still obviously malicious, uh, you know, code running in VBA versus when you can use like this VBA purging technique, for example, to evade detection that entice people to click on these and execute them. So I think it's really important to understand that while there's still a lot of detections for, in my opinion, less sophisticated VBA code for the malicious VBA code. Some of these techniques like VBA purging is going to come out. There's going to be new methods all the time. So again, while it may be an old technique, this may very well work and get past your detection. So you really have to be diligent about, you know, uh, what the, you know, these emails and not be as, uh, curious about what other people make in your organization. Right? <laughs> uh, so anyways, you know, being diligent is, is really important. Uh, Julian, do you have any, you know, suggestions around, you know, how people can be better about, you know, not clicking on some of these. I know you have a lot of IR experience. Obviously, it's one thing to investigate this and another thing to be more diligent. But any pro tips that you want to recommend to anyone? I, I do. Uh, but before I get into that, I do. You, what you just described actually reminds me of, of probably the most effective lure I've seen an attacker use, which I don't know if red teams could do. It might be ethically um, um, ambiguous. But what we saw a real attacker doing in one case was they actually emailed a bunch of employees telling them that they got raises. So, you know, similar to kind of payroll thing, right? People are going to be interested in that. And it said, open this document and make your make sure you, you know, fill it in, enable the macros and submit it so that we can process your raise because you've been such a great worker that, uh, you know, we want to give you this out of band raise and you need to process it by, you know, this Friday so that we can make sure it gets in for the next payroll. And so that was a very effective uh, lure. It sounds similar to what you guys do, but I don't know if we could pull that off on the red team side. <laughs> Might be a little too far for uh, for what you when people get upset. In that case, of course, the employees, I remember one lady said she called her husband and told him to buy a car. And they bought a car thinking that she was getting a raise and it was not not real, which, you know, obviously can, can be pretty impactful to people, right? Um, and so, sorry, I've diverted from what your question was, but I thought that was an interesting 
uh, story that sounded similar to, to kind of what yeah, you're talking about. Thing. And, and a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll be okay. But I remember people were pretty upset after they found out it was not real, at least in that client's environment. Um, so, so, you know, I think people know a lot about these days, making sure to hover over links, right? That was a big thing in security education in the past. Hover over a link. If there's a link in an email or a link in somewhere, see what it is, make sure it's valid. And um, that's still important, but especially with the current modern day types of um, attacks we're seeing, we're starting to see attackers hosting these malicious documents, these maldocs on links that you might actually think are legitimate, like Google Docs, which actually then redirects to a hot link that's hot link from like Slack, for example. So those are domains and systems and services people recognize. So when they hover the link, they're starting to see, oh yeah, well, Google Docs, okay, that makes sense. Or Slack, sure, I know what Slack is. Um, and starting to download that. So that can make it a little more difficult. And so I think security education is very important, um, but you really need to you need to supplement it, right? You, you won't be able to rely on your users. At some point, they're going to click a link. The Red Team guys, as, as they just described, have really good uh, lures and ways of you know convincing people to open documents. And so eventually it will happen, in which case then you really need to have good email security that does some behavioral analysis on, on attachments or links, if possible, following links, multiple directories, so uh, multiple links um, that redirect one another, and and then also endpoint analysis. And uh, I'll talk about a couple of ideas on what you can do in the endpoint uh, later on today. Appreciate that background, Julian. Yeah, no, I mean, being diligent is obviously key uh, to, to a lot of this. You know, like, like Julian said, we also use legitimate web services to host our malicious payloads. And even if we're using our own domain, we'll categorize that domain with like every single spam filter. We'll have a, a legitimate SSL certificate on there. So it all looks very legitimate. So it's that part, it's, it can be very difficult, especially the more targeted it is to your organization. Uh, so going back to the VBA purging technique, which is again, very cool modern edge kind of technique here. You want to talk a little bit more uh, about how you weaponize that in your tool, Andrew? Yeah, for sure. So there should be a public tool now uh, or soon called Office Purge that will VBA purge Word, Excel, and Publisher documents uh, that are in the CFBF format. So there's, just to give a little background on what CFBF format is, is there's the modern OOXML format, which are Word documents and Excel documents that have the extension XLSX or DOCX, or for macro enabled, it would be XLSM and for Excel and for Word, it would be DOCM. So this tool is specifically used uh, VBA purges, CFBF documents. So those are docu Word and Excel documents that have the extension .doc and .xls. And this tool office purge is, is really easy to use. So there's not that many flags or it's not a huge long command that you got to use to VBA purge it. All you got to do is specify the type of document you want to purge. So either Word, Excel, or uh, Publisher, you specify the file name, which is the already weaponized document. And the last argument, the two last arguments I, are either listing the module streams within that document or specifying the module stream that contains your VBA macros to VBA purge. And once you run the command, it'll produce a copy of that, of the original weaponized document and add, um, and it'll let you know that it's the purge one. We'll, we'll see an example soon. So once you run that, then you're ready to go and send it to your target. This is super, super cool. I, I'm, I can't wait to see this in action, which we'll show here in a second. But before we get into that, uh, you mentioned multiple types of documents that are supported with your tool. You know, you mentioned like, I think Publisher, Word, Excel. From what I understand, you know, we talked a little bit about how this works and the EPP plus, or EP plus library, .NET library that's used uh, to weaponize, for example, and not that it's not that it's a malicious .NET library. We just abuse the library to weaponize uh, Excel documents with VBA purging, but it doesn't support, from what I understand in my research, it doesn't support doc or publisher files. So how are you weaponizing those files using VBA purging uh, if you're not going to use that library or do you use that library somehow with them? So 
like I said earlier, when I was building the office document payload generator um, for Mandiant, the .NET library EP plus would only generate Excel documents and it would ac accidentally VBA purge them. There wasn't a tool for, there wasn't any public tool to VBA purge that I know of, uh, Word documents or publisher documents or PowerPoint documents. So to, um, to supplement that, to kind of miss the, the gap that uh, in the offensive security community, uh, that's where I came and built the office purge to VBA purge different the all, the different kinds of documents that EP VBA purge the different types of documents that VBA the EP plus wasn't able to do or didn't support. Yeah, it's like if I was a a, a Maldoc developer, the, what I would do initially, right, is I would just pull up that library in Visual Studio, uh, you know, kind of create my shell code runner and, and weaponize the document that way, for example. So this tool, you know, automating that whole process is very nice for red teamers, and and I think another really good proof of concept tool released out to to show people how this can be done. And um, I would like to see this in action. So Julian, you think we could uh, bring it up real quick and see it in action? Andrew, if you don't mind talking to uh, what's going on in this in this small video clip of, of how it's working, that would be great. Absolutely. Let's give this a shot. So here I have Cobalt Strike up and I use the BBA payload that comes with it. And as you can see, it's using specific Windows API functions from kernel 32.dll, like create remote thread, virtual alloc, write process memory. Um, and so I save that document, just close it, just to show this is a test document. And in that directory where it saves, there's a the office purge tool that uh, will be BA purge it. So there's the help menu. And like I said, there's not that many flags, so it's really easy to use. You can spe you specify that it's a Word document with dash D. Uh, dash F, you specify the file name, and with dash L, it'll list the module streams. And then with dash M, you specify the uh, the module stream that contains the, the malicious VBA code. And it'll tell you what steps it took to VBA purge the document. And to compare the difference between the non-purge document with the purge document, I run strings and pipe it into find str to look for key uh, suspicious strings. So you can see that the original one has write process memory, create process A, and write process memory. Yeah. So whereas the purge one does not contain that, and that is the the key element to VBA purging is that it hides them, it removes them from the performance cache, so it is no longer seen from an uh, from a static analysis point of view. And just to prove that it document will still run, I open it, I enable content, and we got a beacon. And so for folks who maybe aren't as familiar, beacon is essentially the, the backdoor payload or the name of the backdoor that Cobalt Strike comes with. Essentially, that means the system was backdoored and, uh, and now Andrew has full remote access to that machine. Yep, and like I said, it, VBA purging removes suspicious strings that Yara rules and security products depend on uh, from the performance cache. So once it was purged, you saw that you couldn't see the, those suspicious Windows API functions like create process, write process memory. Um, so it definitely makes a difference. And like I said, the detection rate should significantly significantly drop, sometimes even to 100% if, if you're lucky. <laughs> That's a uh, pretty impressive work, man. Uh, so how, how, how did, uh, how did, uh, Brett play into to your development on this? How did you guys work together on that? So Brett is obviously an experienced red team uh, red teamer, and he's he's built a lot of tools. So as some of you may know, he's built Sharp Persist, and uh, which is fantastic. Tool. Last year, I think, right, or two years ago? Last year? Yeah, last year, yeah. Yep. Last year. So he he's got a lot of experience. So he's helped me along the way as to how to structure a code and how your uh, repository should look like. And he's also helped with the articles and giving me feedback, telling me how, what things I should and should not include. So, uh, and, and Brett also was actually the one that inspired me to create the office document payload generator. He's, he, he has this cool technique that I was inspired by. And that's kind of how the, the idea for a payload generator came, came upon. 
Yeah. And really, you know, kind of uh, the mentorship experience of getting to mentor Andrew has been great. I mean, it's been incredible seeing his growth since he started as an intern to now. Um, So that's been, you know, really, really satisfying, really gratifying, you know, for me. And also, you know, being able to just kind of dump my methodology to him, like, this is how I do things. This is my approach. And then watching him internalize that and say, well, we could do this better. Right. So that's like the two biggest things I've really got out of it is, is watching him grow and kind of seeing him kind of internalize kind of how I do things and make them better. So um, really enjoyed kind of, you know, guiding him right in this project and really, you know, really, really pleased with, with what he came up with. This is really great work. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> oh, it's like you're Are muted. You guys hearing Evan? Evan, I think you're. Called it. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was looking at the video there and uh, I noticed, you know, some, some, sim- some familiarity in the code with the, with the shell code runner. Right. And, and we, in this case, we, we you using the API calls, I'm guessing to, to execute your shell code uh, like most shell code runners would. And I think that something that was very interesting, you know, is that we use Cobalt strike in this example. And I think I want to point out that this this holds true, and that same shellcode runner can be used for really any backdoor as long as you can generate shellcode, right? That it will execute shellcode depending on architecture, obviously. Um, you know, to to execute whatever it is that you want. So if you have different backdoors, different C2s that you use, uh, just to point out. And, and Andrew, feel free to chime in here. But um, you know, I feel like that was just as as an example because Cobalt Strike is probably the most widely used. C2 that we see in on red teams, uh, you know, globally. So Andrew, in this case, do you feel like you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier that you're not going to be creating a child process to the parent process because I could generate some suspicious activity. So in this case, are you doing some sort of injection or process creation? So at least a minute, we have different, execution methods to execute our payload. Uh, for this specific example, that was just the default payload that was generated through Cobalt Stripe. And to be honest, I, I haven't looked at the child to parent process relationship between the two, but just uh, it, it is important to understand how from a blue team and from a red teamer's point perspective, to understand how the what's the relationship between a, ch- uh, a parent and child process so in this case the parent process would be word or excel and if you see for example cmd or powershell then that's clearly something malicious going on not all the time but for the most part it is so so like i said earlier there's different ways to uh e- evade or use unique types of execution methods and like like one example was one you gave me over the summer of and that you saw being used in the wild and you were able to obtain that from the intel team right and it's also incorporated into uh the office pillow office document pillow generator that, that we use so so yeah yeah. And in terms of detection, you know, obviously, the, again, this is fairly new. There's not a lot. There's some blog posts out there, but not like a whole bunch of blog posts out there on this and research. Um, hopefully the blog posts that, that you and Brett released will shed some light on this, uh, this, this technique and even potentially more research around detection. But I know we've done some research internally around some of this detection because we, you know, obviously we know about it. We've done some research on the red team side. Julian, you want to kind of talk to a little bit about what detections are in place for that? Yeah. So uh, one of our researchers uh, and the research team, Alyssa Rahman, uh, was actually doing some investigation in, in kind of helping us to prepare and see, uh, you know, what we could find about ways to detect these kinds of documents. And I think Andrew summed it up pretty well earlier, right? So that section that's missing from the document is, I guess, you know, fairly straightforward to identify, um, you know, from that perspective. And it doesn't always mean that every document that's missing this performance cache is malicious, but that's the first place to start. And so she was able to create a, uh, uh, you know, a way of searching through kind of retroactively, um, you know, some of the files that we've seen in the past, because at, even at Mandiant, you know, we we were tracking attackers using VBA stomping, since that's much more well known in the past. And VBA purging, um, we ended up finding a few hundred files that had been purged, not necessarily all malicious. Um, but so far, 
we don't have any public intel on any threat actor groups that's been using this regularly. So I expect to see uh, now that Andrew releases this tool, <laughs> maybe maybe some some group out there will adopt that technique and uh, and start to see it more more commonly. But it's been pretty interesting, actually. Right, very limited use. Even though there had been a couple of um, you know discussions about this topic in the past, not something that's really well known and very uh, highly leveraged. So. I, I expect to to see that grow as as attackers continually try to evade detection, um, you know, when they're sending these malicious docs. And I don't see maldocs necessarily going away as an attack vector. They're probably going to maintain the number one spot as the most common uh, initial vector, or, you know, compromise um, form for 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 a long time, if not forever. Yeah, I know our CEO always kind of harps on the, the, the fact that, right, phishing is always going to be around, that there's always going to come up with new techniques. So it's not a matter of if you get compromised, it's more of a matter of when you get compromised and also being prepared for that and understanding what the impact of that compromise could be and making sure that if you were compromised, you have a good team in place and detection and response capabilities to respond to those attacks. So speaking of that, uh, Julian, do you have any detailed uh, detections and or for evidence that this technique may left behind that, that maybe uh, defenders can can look at to, to help identify this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as uh, as we've talked about, the actual files themselves, you know, they do a pretty decent job at evading static detection uh, from the traditional capabilities. And, and I think even the way that they're created now, you know, if you just try to detect office docs that have been purged, you're not going to have a very high level of confidence in the sense that a lot of those might just be generated by a normal tool that's generating office docs that m maybe doesn't doesn't include the performance cache for whatever reason. Um, but there are a couple of ways to look at this from the endpoint perspective, rather than looking at it from the static analysis perspective, because we know that this is a great me method to, to kind of bypass um, static analysis. And so I have a couple examples here. One is going to be talking about process args, which Andrew kind of touched on. Um, just brief, briefly, right? Parent to child process relationships can definitely be interesting. Um, so obviously if we were, for example, looking at WinWord docs, or this is an example of a malicious email that came in that contained a uh, malicious Word document, right? So this might be an example of something that uh, a victim might receive. And if you're looking at the actual process arguments for the WinWord process itself, whether that be with Sysmon you could have Sysmon installed, and that would give you an EID one, event ID one. If you were to enable, um, you know, in Windows, the uh, you know command line uh, process creation events, that would be forty six eighty eight event IDs. If you have an EDR platform, which a lot of organizations are moving towards, if you don't have it, uh, those often have process uh, or command history, essentially process execution history events. So any of those mechanisms would show you typically child uh, and parent process relationships. And that can be a great way to look for um, these kinds of documents. And then the next level that you'd want to take it to is identifying Office Docs that might be open, for example, from within an Outlook temporary folder, right? Because that can help you to determine if an Office document uh, or the WinWord process was used to access an Office document from within the temp folder of Outlook. And that is another way of kind of just hunting through your environment to see was there evidence or is there evidence of somebody opening up a document? Now that only really works if the document's attached to the email. If it's a link, you know, this, this kind of hunting, you know, isn't going to be as relevant, but if it's a document that's attached to an email, when somebody opens it, if they just double click on that email, it's going to essentially be copied into this temporary directory and opened up. And so what you end up seeing is when they double click on that attachment, uh, WinWord will start in the task manager, uh, but you don't see the full command line arguments unless you have, like an EDR or one of those other logging mechanisms I just talked about. Uh, and what ends up happening is the WinWord executable itself will run with an argument that is the file path to the document that was just double clicked. So this is an example of opening that attachment from that email. You can see the process is winword.exe and the directory where that document is stored is under the content.outlook folder. Uh, so that can be a kind of good way to hunt. So if you're looking through process execution history and you're hunting for hey, does anyone open any documents from uh, an email? That's great. Not really specific to VBA purging, but it's more of a general looking for suspicious uh, office documents being opened from emails. That being said, there are probably going to be a lot of documents that are being opened from emails, right? So then the next thing you might want to do is look for trust records. And this is something that not a lot of folks know about, but there are essentially, there's a registry key in the Windows registry. 
called the trust record registry key. And when somebody has to enable editing on a document that they've downloaded from the internet or open from an attachment or open an email, and then ultimately also enable the macros, that actually essentially is trusting that document. The user is marking that they want to trust this doc, and that leaves behind traces in this trust records uh, registry key. So when a, a document is first enabled, like we just saw in the previous screenshot, an entry will be recorded in this registry key. The entry contains the path and the file name to the document that's been trusted. And there is some data in the uh, in the actual value here itself. Um, the timestamp though, based on research that's been publicly um, you know, discussed in the past for, for a while now, is related to the creation date stamped on the document. It's not actually the time that the user interacted with the file. So keep that in mind if you're ever looking at this. You can you know, access this with various EDR platforms or Red Dripper or something like that. But the more interesting part is this second piece. When somebody clicks on enable content on a document that contains macros, that action actually changes the last four bytes in that particular entry under the trust, reg trust, trust records registry key to FFFFF. 7F. That actually indicates that a user enabled the macros. And so this is a really interesting and great way to try and do hunting for malicious macro enabled documents in an environment by pulling back all of the trust records in the environment, uh, you know, parsing this registry key, whether you have an EDR platform that allows you to do it at scale, whether you're using Red Ripper to parse various registries from the environment, and then checking those final four bytes. So you can narrow it down to entries that have these final four bytes set this way. And now you have a list of documents that have been opened by a user where they've enabled macros. And so this can, you know, hopefully help you to try and identify sy systems where macro enabled word docs or maldocs have been leveraged. And again, this maybe isn't specific to VBA purging, but it is related to any kind of, um, you know, office document that contains a malicious macro, which is, which is going to be very common. And so if you're not able to detect them on the way in statically, this is another great way to hunt through your environment for evidence of, of that happening in the past or, or historically. Summing it up, right? Gather those registry keys, parse them, look for the evidence where the final four bytes were set to actually having the content enabled, review to look for any suspicious outliers or maybe the ones within uh, content.outlook directories. And then you probably want to collect those files and do some additional analysis. And at that point, you're probably going to be doing some static and behavioral analysis on the files that you've got. And this does require the Office installation on systems to uh, be configured not to trust documents by default. There is a way to configure your Office installation so it trusts all documents. It's not the common mechanism. And if your environment has it set like that with GPO, probably best not to have it set that way. It's better to have it where users have to actively trust those documents, especially if they're being downloaded from the internet, because uh, that can be a, a great way of hopefully avoiding this unless the red teamers use a very, a very convincing lure like payroll, and then everyone just wants to open it. You can't resist checking what other people make, right? So I, I commonly get the question when we talk about detections and, you know, uh, the, the, the different things that you mentioned, you mentioned command line arguments, right? The, with uh, the event log, you mentioned registry keys and other file evidence that's left behind. I get asked the question from, from clients all the time, like, Hey, how do I scale that? You know, like, how do I, how do I identify these registry keys that scale these event logs? Like, obviously you can have a SIM and in my experience, a lot of my clients, they have a SIM in place and they generally collect specific logs that are important. They collect those into their SIM. And most of the time it's generally on servers, like right, scaling SIM collection, event log data for workstations, especially if you're a large enterprise with you know hundreds of thousands of, of systems throughout the environment, you, may, you probably don't have enough space or you're gonna pay a, a lot of money in storage for SIM collection, right? Uh, from that perspective. So I think, uh, and Julian, in your experience, co collecting some of this registry data, uh, obviously EDR is a really important platform to do a lot of what we just talked about right now. Do you want to explain how EDRs do that and, and, and or other alternatives people can do to scale this? Yeah, absolutely. So, so EDR, we've used this, I guess, um, you know, a few times now, enterprise detection and response tools. It's kind of a, it's a product line of security platforms that allow you to do not just analysis and forensics investigations across your environment, but also some real-time alerting detection mechanisms. And usually they also contain now anti-malware capabilities. Um, but not all every EDR has the same capabilities, but a lot of them have the ability to parse specific forensic artifacts at scale. So um, 
for Admandian, for example, one of our consultants, um, Dan in, uh, in our Dubai team, who happens actually to be Canadian, he, he wrote, um, a parser. So use through our, through the tool that we use at Mandiant when we're doing our incident response engagements that allows us to parse those trust records and get the results back. And then we can essentially collect this data at scale from, uh, you know, from systems. And another way that I've seen organizations do it is just doing something as simple as, as using Red Ripper, right? Red Ripper is a, a common tool that's used for parsing registry entries, registry keys. This is a, uh, you know, a tool that's freely available out there. If you've taken a SANS class, you might've heard about it before. They, they, you know, use it heavily and a lot of um, incident responders and digital forensics folks out there will, will be familiar with Red Ripper. Um, but then to do, do it at scale, you may need to, to have either a platform that you can use, either EDR, or you can come up with some PowerShell stuff. Um, I think Power Forensics, I don't know actually if it can parse trust records directly, but it should be able to at least, at least allow you to pull back the registry keys of interest. And then you may have to, to parse a little bit um, after the fact. And th these mechanisms that I just talked about, I'd say they're better suited for threat hunting teams. So they're a little bit of a higher level of maturity required. Um, Cause like you said, Evan, it may not be as easy as just putting them into a SIM and, and then reviewing all of them. Yeah, um, scaling is always a, a, a problem, right? That I get asked about all the time. And I generally have some great recommendations around it. And, and one other thing I will mention to kind of add to what Julian was saying is, you know, a lot of people will throw money at the problem when generally when people throw money at problems, that means more technology. So let's just say they buy the EDR, they have their SIM and that'd be it. So the, the other problem is, well, what, do you, what are you going to look for? So doing the research behind that is also important. Getting the intel that's necessary to be effective with your technology, I think, is a critical component that people sometimes miss. So you can't just out of the box, you know, have technologies and expect them to work. Some EDRs have great out of the box signatures, but most of them are refinable. You can add indicators of compromise, IOC signatures. Uh, and I think it's really important to kind of go through some of this testing to make sure that you can detect on some of these latest activities. And on top of that, another thing is, 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 is it's three things, right? It's people, process and technology. So let's just say you have technology and then you actually go through some of this testing. You refine that technology. It's effective. It's, it's alerting. And then you have all these alerts. Well, how do you go from an event to an incident? Do you have a process in place for that? Do you have a procedure? What's your response strategy? Do you even have incident response playbooks? So I think it's really important also to understand like all these techniques exist, all these attacks exist. We go through them all the time, but understanding that you have to respond to them and making sure that your people process the technology is you know very efficient, refined and effective is key. And the last thing you want to do is try to go through those three things and those processes when you're actually compromised, because at that point, it's probably too late and the attackers are already getting what they want out of it. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And uh, to add on to what Evan just mentioned, you know, from the IRs I've worked, so the incident response engagements where clients call us in, they're breached and they need our help. In all of the cases in my recent memory that I've worked on, there has been some detection by a tool that the client had they just didn't have people looking at it or knowing how to respond to it correctly. And so that's exactly what Evan said, right? You can have the tech, but it's not just about buying cool technology. You have to have skilled resources to operate that technology well and have defined processes and procedures on what to do. Uh, we had a case, the case I'm working on right now, um, you know, that they had something that told them there was a compromised host. And ultimately that ended up becoming a ransomware encryption event that, you know, really affected that organization, right? That's business impacting in a major way. And sadly, they had an alert that they had investigated. They just didn't have playbooks that really guided them on what they should do. And so they weren't able to contain and stop the incident before it took, you know, went too far and, and the attacker was able to complete their mission. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because like we get customers that will hire us to do on the opposite side, right? On the red team side, like, hey, come to a red team. We throw all this money at our technology. Like we're the greatest. Like there's no way you're going to get into our environment or no way you're going to accomplish the objectives. And at nine times out of 10, we do, if not even more, sometimes 10 out of 10, like to be honest. So I think it's super important to be proactive about this. You know, the last thing you want to do is, you know, try to, like, like Julian said, right, identify evidence that compromise from your tech too late when you're actually compromised. Going through some of these proactive services like a pen test or red team, I think is very healthy for an organization, honestly, to do probably annually to truly answer the question, are we, do we have an effective response team? Can we detect on an actual compromise? Because you don't really know the answer until you actually go through the exercise. Uh, so again, I think it's a super, super important to mention 
Um, and also, uh, if you uh, back to the topic of VBA purging, Andrew and Brett, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, for those of you who didn't hear Andrew mention earlier, there's going to be the tool that we demo today is going to be released. Same thing with the blog post. We're trying to tie it with the release of our, you know, with the state of hack, but we, uh, it may not be exactly that. So stay tuned to keep up with our blogs and our publications because the, the blog and the tool will be released here shortly. And uh, awesome, awesome research, Andrew and, and Brett. I, I really appreciate again your time today. Uh, so next episode for Julie and I is going to be in January. So we'll see y'all next year. And uh, Austin Baker and Doug Beanstalk will have another Stay the Hack episode here in December. So uh, it'd be funny if they have like, you know, Santa hats or something on for, for that episode. I think it would be, be pretty interesting. I'm they not called them out. They've got to do it now. They've got to do it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, any, any last minute comments from anyone uh, before we, we end today's episode? Yeah. Um, I just have one last thing to say. Um, if you're a student who is interested in looking for internships, I highly recommend applying to, to FireEye and, uh, and Mandiant. Uh, I'm sure you'll not regret it and you will be challenged and you will learn a lot and very quickly and you'll be surrounded by very, very smart people. Nice job, man. I'll Venmo you after for that. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thanks everyone for the time. Uh, Thanks for the audience for tuning in today and we'll see you on the next episode of State of the Hack. Thank you. See you guys. Take care. See you.